Hello everyone, it is the 29th of June 2020. I'm speaking to Christine Brett again today um, from the Us For Them campaign about the situation that we are living in at the moment with children and when they go back to school and when they go back to school whether they're going to suffer because of things like blended learning and social distancing. Christine, we spoke briefly on the phone and uh, I know we've been in touch over the last few days. I am so glad that I can use this channel to get your uh, message out there. This channel is all about protecting children and, and you said to me, I'm struggling to sleep at night and you've got kids, I've yeah. got kids, I'm struggling to sleep at night and you sent me a document which you can have a look at in a minute. This is why I realised it's so urgent that I speak to you and so urgent yeah. that I get this on out onto the channel on all of my channels and do whatever I can and this is an appeal to other journalists and please, please listen to people like Christine, the case studies from professionals all over the country about how children are suffering um, with the lockdown and how they may also continue to suffer um, when they go back to school. So yeah, I read that document. We're gonna have a look at it in a minute. It's a, basically yeah. a different case studies from a, a counselor at a primary school. Mm -hmm. um, but there are so many more. So how have things been? There's been some success, I believe, in Scotland. So things are happening with the Us For Them campaign up in Scotland. And this is good news as well, because you've got, you're rallying together all of these professionals, all of these parents, all of these concerned teachers, counselors, are getting yeah. together and they're campaigning and it's making a difference so christine welcome to the channel and thanks, thanks thank you thanks for having me on again so yeah things are going well we've we've got groups now in scotland in wales in northern ireland and in england separate groups that are we're bringing together all the parents in those areas along with the teachers and the the professionals the medics the child health specialists the educational specialists are coming together trying to find a way that we can get our kids back to school normally that's all we want we just want them to be able to go back to school um, back to normality and start the process of recovery they've all been out of school now for three months we, we know in england only 10 percent of children are back at school 10 percent out of all our kids are back at school so we need to do something but what's really concerning us now is the stories that we're hearing about the vulnerable children so a lot of People say, you know, it's fine, my kids are at home, they're having a nice time, you know, they're, they're doing well with me, they're having fun, great. But actually, I think we need to take a bigger view as a society and think about what's happening to the children that aren't having such a good time. And what's really worrying me is the fact that so many, you know, we, we know about a lot of these children because people are coming forward and telling us we've got social workers, we've got, you know, counsellors, we've got you know, safeguarding specialists, but what about the ones that aren't? Mm -hmm. So far, 80% of vulnerable children have not been in school. So what's happening to those 80%? Because- Where's that figure from? Uh, where, where did you get the that? The figures from? from, those figures are from the government figures that were published last week showing how many children have been attending school, how many children that they class as vulnerable, so children with a, you know, an EHP, a, a plan, or children with a social worker and only 20% of those children have been to school during oh, this time. And what, what's more, we must mention this article that was in The Telegraph. The Telegraph are doing some good work at the moment, I have to say. Yeah. Um, it was on the 25th of June, this particular article, NHS treatment delays links to more, is linked to more child deaths. Explain the number of deaths due to so, parents not getting treatment for their children. Yeah, so this flagged up a report from the Royal College of Paediatricians and Child Health. They're the leading doctor for children's health in this country they've got a surveillance unit and they found that nine children have died mm -hmm. because their parents were too scared to seek medical help they're too scared to go to the nhs because all we hear about is coronavirus but these children have died not from coronavirus but from other conditions because they weren't able to access medical help or their parents were too scared to, to access medical help. That's frightening to me that people are now so scared of the virus that they're dying from other things. When actually for children, we know for children, the virus is very self-limiting. There's less than 2% of cases are in children. It's a minimal uh, self-limiting disease. We've got 1,500 paediatricians that have come out and given a public statement to say, you know, these children are, this virus is not a threat to children. They've got a very limited role in even transmitting it. We need to get these children back to school because school is a place of safety for so many of them. And we need to, parents to know that they can access, um, you know, medical treatment when they need it because it's not, you know. We must make sure, we must make sure, I mean, people have lost children to COVID-19. Yeah. Um, we believe in that, in that uh, Telegraph article, it says six children under the age of 15 have died from COVID-19. 
so for the families affected it is awful 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 but we are and if i was in politics i'd be very clear with the public and explain people are we're going to die right at the beginning of this and it is awful situation we're going to have to deal with you know in and children especially they're the most precious things to us absolutely in, in absolutely. society um, but how do we balance this so that you know that the risks and the damage to children is 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 less and i really do think that we've got a problem here um with the lockdown and vulnerable children i completely agree with you and um, because we don't hear so in journalism journalism in the media it's very difficult to hear from vulnerable families and vulnerable children they yeah, don't have the big press releases being pumped out to newsrooms and case studies the other thing that we've got a problem with, there are other case studies, and I've asked the organisations in Scotland, the Us For Them campaign in Scotland and Wales to put forward case studies. We've got to be very careful that we protect the identity of these families. But I really do urge people to contact me. Um, we, your anonymity will remain. I won't release uh, people's names or details, but we do need to hear these stories. I think that's really... We, we really need to hear these stories. And I think... You know, um, it's so difficult for these people because they're struggling anyway. And to say that they're, they're struggling is such a big step for them. And we're really grateful to all the parents that have stepped forward with their stories, that they are they are willing to, to admit that they're struggling. All parents mm -hmm. are struggling. You know, P Professor Viner from the Royal College said, you know, all children will have been affected by this, but they're not actually affected from the effects of the COVID-19. They're affected from the effects of schools being closed and them losing their whole social you know network and in, in engagement and we, we really need to protect our children and we really need to get our children back to school and back to normality I, and back to safety for a lot of these children school is a place of safety for so many children and we've lost all our safeguarding mechanisms we know that safeguarding referrals are down by 50 percent we know from doctors in the northeast they published a study last week that showed that they've had you know a third less people come into their into their system you know because of concerns about them so this is a really scary time we need to stop this now we can't wait until september to get these mechanisms put back we need to do something now absolutely and and it is difficult to be vulnerable i'll be vulnerable here and it, and say to um the people watching and to my audience and followers and anyone else you know my eldest son had a place um we were given a couple of places a, a week and he won't go back because he's scared so even though he's got a place, the fear messages have got to in his anxiety and uh, he's not taking up that place. And um, so I've been personally affected and we all have to be vulnerable and tell our stories um, because it's only those stories, that vulnerability that will get to the politicians and the decision makers. And I do believe change is happening. You told me about Scotland. What's yeah. happened in Scotland? So Scotland, we've, we've had, um, you know, a great a surge of... Uh, parents who and teachers who are really keen to get this moving they're, they're due to go back in august so they're due to go back ahead of um, the english schools and last week their education minister announced there'd be no social distancing in schools and we're hoping that that announcement will also come through for england and wales we know in in northern ireland they've reduced it to one meter but we're saying no to all of the social distancing because we feel first of all it stops all children getting back to school full time and also because we know that it's promoting behaviors that are very damaging you know my daughter's gone back she doesn't like it she doesn't like being told to do partner work two two meters apart she doesn't like her friends moving away from her when when she goes near them so we know that these these are are promoting behaviors that will be very damaging to children and we know that children really need to get back to normality to re-establish their friendships and to, to, to restart their learning as soon as possible um, you know for us to start some kind of recovery for them and um, I mean, it's anxiety, isn't it? I, I think we had a lockdown period. We come out of the lockdown, but we're moving into an anxiety situation. So if you try and go to the shops, I've tried to go shopping. A woman mm -hmm. with an iPad comes up to me and says, please put some sanitizer, hand sanitizer on, wants to take details of who I am. And, and, and I've been to a charity shop in Newent, where I'm from. And uh, I was, people were being shouted at. And I keep thinking of vulnerable people like uh, people with Alzheimer's or people that don't speak English. Um, and they are panicked and, and there's a lot of anxiety. And it's the same with the schools. So yeah. you know, when the schools open, for example, three different entrances, three staggered times, this anxiety is going to be with the parents. For example, where I am, they did open the schools three hours a week for three weeks in Wales. But you were given three different entrances, three different start times. 
Um, and the anxiety can be so overwhelming for parents to get it wrong and not really so confused about uh, and worried as well that the children are going into an environment where they will maybe told off for being yeah. too close. And it's just there's so much anxiety about getting back to normal. I think there is. And I think children, you know, adults are very anxious at the moment. And we heard, didn't we, from Professor Ellie Lee, how damaging that is for children when the adults around them don't know what's happening and don't know what to do. That's really disconcerting for children. So, you know, we've also heard from lovely head teachers who said, you know, as adults, we have to be the mature, honest ones. Teachers have to be the mature, honest ones and really, you know, bring them back into an, an environment that's nurturing that's supportive that helps them feel a bit more stability I think we need some stability now in our lives we've had all this uncertainty for a long time parents need to know can they go back to their jobs or are they expected to stay at home and, and help their children learn you know children need to know when they're going back to school and it's not enough to say let you know we'll, we'll, we'll get them all back in September we really need to see the details of that plan we really need to know what it looks like for our children so we can help them and prepare them for going back because they've been out of school now for a long time and even just you know getting up and and going and doing the school run and and that whole school day thing that's going to be a, a big deal for some children to go back into that when they've been used to being at home with their parents and their families so we really need to get that assurance now we need to get those safeguarding measures back established back properly to protect the vulnerable children as well um and a message to the unions as well they want to represent teachers and a population that really passionately cares about children and what's best for children. Do you think that they are going to be on side the unions or do you think they could prevent this from happening? Well, you know, the unions represent their members and, you know, their members are teachers and we completely understand that they have to represent their best interests. But I think that most teachers go into teaching because they want to help children learn and that's what we need to do. And I understand there's fear out there. I understand there's anxiety from the teachers as well. But look, we have an awful lot of information now about what's going on. We've got 22 countries the schools have returned we've had countries where schools have never closed i was talking to a friend this morning from australia schools only closed there for three weeks they're back to normal we're not seeing in any of the studies and there's more and more evidence building now we're not seeing any evidence that children transmit this virus to adults or to teachers there's been no cases from a child to a teacher and all the studies show that the children are not the ones that are transmitting this. It's the adults that are transmitting it to each other. So by all means, you know, have measures in place that, you know, keep the, the teachers apart from each other, keep adults, you know, safe. But please don't inflict this on our children because they are not responsible for this virus. And it's too much to expect them to carry the weight of the responsibility for that. OK, well, Christine, um, thank you for doing what you can. We're all, I think, anyone who feels passionately about this, like you say, it's difficult to sleep at night thinking about those vulnerable children. Yeah. Um, all we can do, if you see this message and you agree with this, this statement, um, or if you don't agree with it, please comment and share this broadcast. Um, I would really encourage people to do that. And like I was saying before, get your case studies to Christine or myself and the Us For Them campaign in Scotland, the Us For Them campaign in Wales, um, and we'll put pressure on those making the decisions about the social distancing. So um, thank you for all that you're doing, Christine, and uh, I'm sure you. your kids are very proud of you. It is a very difficult time for all of us to stay strong at the moment um, when it we is. are so concerned mm -hmm. about children. Thank you so much for having us on. And, and, and if, if people want to sign our petition, it's at the us, usforthem.co.uk. Please, uh, you know, come on our site. There's letters there that you can use. There's letters for teachers and for doctors to sign up to as well. So we really welcome everyone's involvement in this campaign to get our kids back to school normally.